on the one hand, and sense of reality on the other hand, not always apparent in your interpretations and more well appreciated. On the right hand side, the balloon is an indication of that. Because I remember at least two times that you showed this in your presentations and calls the um, intriguing question is the balloon filled with hydrogen, one of the central molecules in your career, or with hot air? <laughs> 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 that brings me to the um, uh, topic of, uh, of today, well not the balloon in particular, but more in general, I think that um, Dr. Oswald Nielsen has studied extensively catalyst stability, realizing that it's nice to understand activity and selectivity, but also we would like to couple the structure of the catalyst to its stability. And the two elements of choice today, copper and nickel, I would say central elements in the uh, in the uh, company on the top so that uh, Dr. Russell Nielsen has worked with for such a long period of time. So those will be the elements that I will discuss. It will be related to synthesis gas yes, conversion, as our chairman already indicated, um, and we will try to um, consider the aspects of the catalyst that have impact on uh, catalyst stability, in particular related to particle growth or the inhibition thereof. Copper for methanol synthesis and nickel for methanation. So synthesis gas conversion, uh, CO and nitrogen can be made from any carbon containing source by appropriate technology. Then depending on the metal, for with copper we produce methanol, with nickel, methane, the other elements I will not discuss today, but copper and nickel will be the yeah. end. So supported catalysts in many ways. Uh, many examples, many uh, um, uh, situations. So indicated in red here, metal nanoparticles, say with a size of 1 to 10 nanometers, on support, dispersed on the support, uh, particle size 50 nanometers or larger. And these structural features that are related to stability are a number, uh, but in particular, uh, today we will uh, discuss the middle particle size, middle particle distribution, the support properties like the pore diameter and so on, and also the surface properties. Just to dwell briefly on the metal particle distribution, I'm not referring here to the size distribution, but rather the spatial distribution. So if we have a support material with these uh, images indicated in gray, uh, uh, the silica support in this specific case, and um, uh, the black dots, the nanoparticles of a given size, distributed in very different ways in this schematical overview. So, a uniform <coughs> distribution of nanoparticles, in fact, maximizing this interparticle space uh, or uh, the uh, uh, distance between the nanoparticles. This is the minimum distance, you might say, the particles are clustered, and this is what we often also uh, um, are confronted with in industrial catalyst uh, that is high density domains of nanoparticles in certain areas of the support while other areas of the support are empty. And the question is to what extent these structural features play a role in stability and of course we expect that if nanoparticles grow it's our dominating the activation mechanism that catalyst stability will be affected by this structural feature. Because particle growth uh, is apparent in many uh, 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 synthesis uh, processes, and either migration and coalescence or also ripening may be apparent. Migration and coalescence, in fact, uh, are re relying on the mobility or the diffusion, if you like, of nanoparticles on the support at uh, above certain temperature and conditions, and that migration may uh, lead to uh, uh, coalescence, <coughs> ending up with a larger particle and thereby a lower specific surface area for the metal. In Oswald's ripening, the particles are not mobile, or at least assumed to be, but rather the communication or transport between particles is via either the gas phase or surface diffusion of small species, be it molecular or even atomic, and that implies that with a higher concentration uh, for the uh, monomers, 
uh, with the small particles, there's a net flux from small particles to large particles, and again, we end up with larger particles to the end. This has been studied over decades uh, by many uh, researchers, uh, and so uh, names are indicated. Now let's have a look for copper for methanol synthesis, uh, and we will discuss three aspects. Distribution of the copper nanoparticles, effective support porosity, and support uh, uh, composition, if you like, uh, affected by uh, support functionalization. This study has been headed by uh, Professor <coughs> Petra de Jong, working with uh, Gonzalo Prieto, Giovanna Zesevic, and Roy van der Berg. Methanol synthesis, a very important process uh, with a world production of methanol over 50 million tons per annum, with a typical catalyst composition, copper, zinc, oxide, uh, uh, alumina, uh, temperature ranges indicated, pressure ranges indicated, and the catalyst deactivation is significant and largely uh, um, caused by copper uh, particle growth. And what we did is move away from the uh, commercial catalyst to a model catalyst in your life with a silica based ordered means of porous material. Uh, so-called SBA-15, with these, of course, with a diameter of 8 nanometers in this case, uh, and these are the other textural properties. We place copper and zinc oxide on those, uh, on those supports, and we do that by an incipient wetness impregnation method with concentrated uh, copper and zinc nitrate uh, solutions, aqueous solutions with the copper zinc ratio indicated here. We dry carefully, uh, uh, at room temperature in vacuum, and that copper nitrate hydrate that is dispersed over the silica is now decomposed in two different ways. The temperature is indicated here, either we use a nitrogen flow, which gives us a uniform distribution of copper nanoparticles, or we use a gas flow containing uh, two volume percent of nitric oxide in nitrogen, and then we get high density domains of copper nanoparticles <coughs> of similar sizes but very different in the particle spacing, as I will show in the next slide. Subsequently, we move to catalysis with typical conditions for, um, for uh, copper and uh, for ethanol synthesis. Of course, important is CO2 that brings about some steam in the syngas and, and has also an important <coughs> uh, catalyst uh, stability. So first of all, we move to the uh, distributions. Uh, so the fundamental feature that we published a couple of years ago is that after drying, the copper nitrate nitrate is not uniformly distributed on the support. So in yellow, the support in red, the copper nitrate schematically, and we get patches of copper nitrate and empty parts on our support. Typical for metal nitrates with limited interaction with silica. If we uh, do the calcination in a mixture of nitric oxide and nitrogen, we get nanoparticles of this typical size, and more or less uh, we find patches of nanoparticles, high-density domains, which more or less is the footprint of the copper nitrate. And we have empty spaces on our Calcination in air or nitrogen gives us redispersion of the copper nitrate and nitrite, and this is a very uniform distribution of the copper with similar sizes, not identical, but similar. Now the um, chemistry behind it is in this paper. It's a bit too much detail to go in depth, but we use this methodology to just change the thermal treatment, so it's identical loading uh, and identical precursors. We, we can change now the inter-particle space. And that's what we did. So in this electron tomography study that we published in 2013, the nitrogen calcination shows in this SPA 15, so we have pores running in this direction, that these copper particles of about 6 nanometers or so are rather uniformly distributed throughout the porous body of the SPA 15. Whereas with the NO calcination, there's certain pores which are heavily filled and other pores are empty. So we have a very non-uniform distribution and high-density domains in these uh, mesopores. Now, if we, we can quantify all this later, so we get a particle size distribution, 
for the no calcination part are a bit larger, uh, or, uh, but more importantly, the particle particle distances, first and second nearest neighbors, are very much larger for the N2 calcination than with the NO calcination. So clearly, these small interparticle spacings with the NO calcination and much larger spacing with nitrogen. And that has a direct bearing on the stability. So for the nitrogen calcination, we get a very stable performance under these conditions, while the NO calcination tablet gives us a much uh, more rapid deactivation. The uh, proposal that we put forward in this paper uh, that particle-particle migration and coalescence may be important in the case of the small interparticle spacing, while the large interparticle spacings that are apparent in this sample may lead to uh, that oswald ripening takes over. That was where the paper ended, and of course we were a bit uh, speculative at that moment in time. So we continued along two lines, uh, along a couple of lines this study. The first one, to use silica gel materials, where we had a um, variation of the support for diameter, and we used two sets of catalysts. One was the nitrogen calcination material, so uniform distributions, and one with NO calcination with small interparticle spaces, so high density domains. And what we found for the uh, so we, we analyzed the deactivation data, this is the second order deactivation constant on the vertical axis and on the horizontal axis is the support diameter. And surprisingly, when the interparticle spacings are large, the system doesn't respond to the poor diameter. Whereas in the case of particles being close to gravity, the poor <coughs> diameter is very important depending on the specifics of the loading and so on. Uh, but the four diameter is a very important one, uh, uh, supporting the view that uh, particle migration, which of course uh, means that, that the four network and the four uh, architecture is important for particles that they can reach each other, is important in this case. While here, most likely the particles communicate via possible ripening, and the four diameter is not, uh, not uh, important. We extended that work and we published that last year where we moved on the one hand from, we moved from silica gel also to SBA uh, type systems of the SBA 16 types which is not the one dimensional uh, uh, that I showed before but rather the cage like structures and jumping to the conclusion uh, for the deactivation rate constant on the vertical axis is proportional again to the four uh, or entrance size of the cages in case of the uh, NO calcite samples, so the particles are close together, and then we get a very nice relationship between the activation and four the end. So this is all nice for particle migration and coalescence, but the fact remains that if the bis distances are large, there is still communication between particles, and that's possible ripening. So what can we do to suppress that? Uh, 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 route for particle growth. And we uh, started the study to functionalize the support and keep the particle size distribution and the particle particle distance constant. That's quite a challenge, I should say, but we were able to do so. We started from uh, Stöber silica spheres and we modified the Stöber silica spheres uh, by amino propyl uh, triethoxysilane. And in that way, we got functionalized, uh, we got functionalization of our support with amino groups uh, rather than the OH groups on the silica. And by a careful uh, <coughs> operation, we can keep the texture and the further um, uh, pore diameter, pore volume, etc., very close. The challenge is now to, be, to have on both supports similar particle sizes and particle particle distances. And that we did as follows. Um, so the silica, unfunctionalized, we impregnated with copper nitrate and we used nitrogen calcination to get our redistribution and um, maximum spacing between the copper particles and this is the typical size uh, distribution that we obtained and we have our functionalized silica and here we use the NO calcination for reasons that I can't elaborate upon here but at the end 
you get very close particle size distribution and again a very uniform distribution. Of course now you, because of the presence of the amino groups. So similar, similar copper oxide particle sizes and distributions on both supports. And that gives us a uh, the activity versus time for the functionalized materials in red, very stable uh, performance, whereas with the unfunctionalized silicon we have uh, more extensive particle growth, which is also apparent from our fresh catalyst on the left hand side, and after 240 hours of methanol synthesis on the right hand side, very modest growth for the functionalized support, whereas quite extensive growth for the unfunctionalized support. Interestingly, the catalyst activity initially and the turnover frequency are very close, so our functionalization doesn't have an impact on the copper uh, particles here, but the deactivation, uh, the second order deactivation rate constant changes by a factor of almost three. So we think that by support functionalization and support properties in general, we can slow down Oswald writing. The second example uh, that I would like to show is nickel for methanation. And again, uh, in fact, we felt that interparticle spacing would be crucial, so we started to vary the interparticle spacing, and also we varied the initial particle size. Uh, again, we used uh, this is work from uh, Peter Munich, uh, and we cooperated with Dr. Sidney Gomez from the University of Liège in Belgium on this, and we published uh, part of these results uh, uh, last year in this paper. We used again our knowledge that we developed over the years on metal nitrate chemistry to control size and distribution. That is not trivial, so here are the, some of the references. Um, it is um, Again, the nickel nitrate with limited interaction with the silica tends to, to aggregate in, in certain areas of your support, but if you use freeze drying, so you solidify the metal nitrate during the sublimation of water, then we get very uniform distribution. So here we use conventional drying to get clustered or high density domains and freeze drying to get uniform distributions. Again, we use the thermal treatment but now use the nitrogen to get some of larger particles and the NO to get some of smaller particles. Again, this is not trivial uh, in respect, with respect to the center about copper, but in these references all the details are there and I think we understand that quite well. Then we used uh, electromicroscopy of microtope thin sections uh, and we uh, assessed the stability for the methanation reaction. And there's a variety of papers over the years, including uh, those of Dr. Rosser Eelson, that show that at low temperature methanation conditions, Oswald ripening is the dominating, uh, dominating mechanism for particle growth. And we use that information to, uh, to come up with a quantitative model to describe the catalyst deactivation. So, straight away to the catalyst after reduction at 500 degrees C, but before catalysis. And these codes read as follows, nickel, the D is uh, the distributed uh, or, or uniform uh, distribution, and C stands for clustered. Uh, so here we have nickel particles of around uh, 8 nanometers or so in size, here we have 9 nanometers, so the number here indicates the size in nanometers, 9 nanometer particles, but clustered together, and for the 4 and 3 nanometer particles, so quite substantially larger, we always have high density domains, so we indicated nickel C4 and nickel C3. And those, those <coughs> four systems we are going to study in the methanation reaction, uh, um, here in the particle spacings, which vary of course, so the much larger for the uniform sample than for the clustered one. Um, but here is the uh, methanation, the activity on the horizontal, uh, on the vertical axis versus the time on stream. And what we see is that the C3, C4 samples, here in blue and in red, the triangles and the circles, those are very active, while the larger particles, the 8 and the 9, start off at quite some lower activity, according uh, more or less at the same turnover frequency. 
quantify the data. However, these very active tablets initially, they deactivate extremely fast, and both these lines, after a few hours on stream already, drop below the ones with the catalyst with the larger nickel particles. So the larger nickel particles, initially less active, after a couple of hours are more active because they are much more stable. And also what was apparent that whether we have large spaces between the nickel particles or small spaces, so uniform distribution or cluster, that both gives a very similar deactivation. So the particle-particle distance does not seem to matter. So the proximity of nickel particles and no impact on stability, but the smallest particles have the highest initial activity, but the largest particle the highest final activity, you might say. The spent catalyst immediately show what happens. So with the D8 and C9, we see a big growth of the particles, but not very much, while initially and the scale bar is 50 nanometers, and it's really at 3, 4 nanometer, and 3 nanometer particles. Here, we have huge chunks of nickel, which, by the way, is not outside the pore network. This is very important. We do ultra microtopy, so this is not nickel on the outside of the grain, as many people have suggested. It is nickel inside the porous network. That's very important for the remaining of the story. So keep that in mind. This is ultra microtopy sections. So these huge chunks of nickel, they generate the space inside a, uh, a pore network that's quite uniform in its We said that Oswald Weibling is our working hypothesis based on many, uh, many important publications in the past. So the nickel carbonyl is formed with a small particle and that flex to the large particle in the particle growth. This is some key assumptions for the modeling. So the nickel carbonyl pressure is a function of the radius r of the particle according to the Kelvin equation. The diffusion of nickel carbonyl is not the rate limiting step. And there's a, a, a lot of evidence from that if you do the quantitative modeling, but that is, that is impossible because then the system will deactivate within seconds rather than within hours. So the rate determining step of particle growth is the decomposition of the nickel carbonyl. That's, that's the assumption we made. And we modeled an ensemble of particles based on the Kelvin equation for uh, generating the carbonyl and the kinetic equations to decompose the middle uh, uh. We have two types of growth, one where the particle diameter is smaller than the pore diameter, and one for confined growth when the particle is larger than the uh, pore radius. Sorry, the pore radius is smaller than the pore uh, radius. The particle. <laughs> I arrived last night at 12 o'clock in the hotel. You understand, right? We are still a bit uh, dizzy, but it's about particle radius and four radius. So off we go. These are the, pre the key equations. This is the Kelvin equation, well known. So the nickel carbonyl pressure goes exponentially with 1 over r, r being the radius of the particle. Uh, then there's two types of growth. One is unhindered growth. So we just say we have an ensemble of particles and they can grow whatever their size is. And the rate of growth for a given particle radius has to do with uh, a growth parameter that we quantify from kinetics and everything, something in nanometers per second or so. This is the super saturation that is set by the carbonyl pressure uh, of the ensemble of particles over the particle radius that we consider for growth, and this uh, is again this Kelvin factor. This is, this is rather straightforward, the Kelvin equation with this kinetical uh, limitation. And then there is confined growth, that is to say, we assume that this exponent is hitting a barrier. This capital lambda has to do with the elastic properties uh, of the support. So if you hit the wall, then there's a new pressure, uh, similar to the surface tension, you might say, as a pressure on the particle to become stabilized. So that we uh, uh, involve mathematically in this term. And there we go. These are the results. So again, the activity as a function of time. Uh, these are the experimental data. And we have two sets of uh, uh, modeling efforts. And that's indicated here. Uh, the unhindered particle growth is in blue. So what we see is that 
but we start to model the small for the small particles that by by far the best or realistic fits can only be obtained if we assume that the particles can go unhindered, there's no confinement, as if the pores don't exist in the support. Whereas the large particles, and although we have quite a spread, uh, depending on the assumption of turnover frequency, there's a slight structure sensitivity in this reaction. It's complicated now, but don't forget about it. But basically, we can only in confined growth we get the model, which is the dotted line and the full line, we can the right order of magnitude for the for the uh, deactivation. And the unhindered growth gives unrealistic low uh, uh, activity predictions. So the um, um, graphical summary um, is as follows. So if you have particles of a bit different size, because they're not never exactly equal, although we have rather narrow particle distribution, always differences. And that implies if we are in the poor network, that if we have very small particles, the supersaturation is such that the pores on the system, they can break the pores and generate new pores, uh, and you get very large particles compared to the original pore diameter. If you start off larger, they grow in confinement because the supersaturation is lower and the forces on the wall are such that they are, uh, and the strength of the uh, support is such that they can confine the growth. Here you find all the details and also the uh, mathematical modeling that I uh, discussed or briefly introduced on the previous slide. So with that, um, copper uh, catalyst for methanol synthesis uh, from our model catalyst. I, I, I think that's important to say that if particles are close together, we think that particle migration dominates uh, and that particle-particle distances matter and also the support velocity is important. If particles are remote from each other, we know being more than two, its own, two times its own diameter, oscillant ripening dominates, a narrow particle size distribution is favorable, but also support functionalization may slow down particle growth. Nickel catalyst for methanation. Uh, in fact, for stable catalyst performance, it's better to start with larger particles that grow in confinement rather than the small ones which break up the support uh, system. Of course, uh, support for many parties uh, for the copper uh, work, very important. The uh, DOE funded EFRC, headed by uh, Jerry Spivey. And for the copper work, the, uh, I also would like to highlight here the support from Moldy Topso, in particular the work on support functionalization and the people who we work with, including the NSA that and Steve Helder from Moldy Topso, and, and others are mentioned in this slide. And welcome to University University and thank you for your attention.